our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. For those of you who have been, uh, been following along um, and as we've gone through this, this, this church year, um, you, you might have noticed that uh, the Gospel writer, Marx, has a, has a certain uh, preoccupation, a certain preoccupation with, um, with demons. Uh, the Gospel of Mark begins really very quickly, right after Jesus' baptism, with, with Jesus being driven out, uh, driven out into the wilderness where he was tempted by Satan. And no sooner does that happen, he calls the first few disciples, and Jesus begins to cast out demons. And then there are instances where demons would proclaim Jesus after their own fashion, where demons would say, I know who you are. I know who you are. You're the Son of God. And Jesus would silence them. Out. Mark thought a lot about demons, probably thought a lot about the devil. As I mentioned earlier, I've, I've had kind of a, a, a week, and, and some of that has actually been uh, wrestling with the devil. So just to let you know, uh, uh, Tia really hates that. Tia really hates when I wrestle with the devil. For one thing, it, it often happens late at night. It often happens late at night, and the next morning, it, it's, it's terrible. There's, there's sulfur and, and brimstone all over the living room, and the, 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 the carpets are singed, and the curtains are a mess. Suit, had horns and 
pitchfork. I mean, it wouldn't make sense. You know, I was like, get behind me, Satan. But this would be as if, this would be as if I were walking down the street with Norman. I'm walking down the street with Norman. And, and we're just walking down the street. And of course, I'm talking because I, I always talk. And, and I'm not paying attention, which usually happens when I start walking. And I'm walking, and I'm about to step off the curb and coming down the street, barreling down the street. It's a baloney truck, and Norman, with all of his mortal strength, grabs him by the scruff of the neck, or think by the ponytail, or something, and he says, get back on the curb before you get killed. And of course, any normal person would say, what? Thanks. Thanks, Norman. And Norman, I need a beer or something, or at least a baloney sandwich, you just saved my life. But instead, I go to Norman and I say, get behind me, Satan. She's about to be stoned. She 
He's about to be stoned, and Jesus comes upon this scene, and he manages to disarm the execution group. Well, you, you know how he, you know how he does this, right? You know, you know how he does this. Where it's right there in verse uh, seven, second half of verse seven. He says to all these people, "If any one of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her." And you can imagine how this works. You know, from the least to the greatest. And, and, you know, the oldest guy first. The guy who lived a long life and remembered all the sins that he got away with, because he's still standing there. And he realized he has no right to throw that stone. Way down the little boy, who was so excited because he was getting to attend his first stoning. And I wish I were to see this about that. They all dropped their rocks. They all just dropped the stones. And then Jesus says something phenomenal. At verse 10, it says, Jesus. Straightened up. And I could probably make a sermon out of that phrase right there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Or as we hear from a different telling of this, where are your accusers? Has no one condemned you? The devils are gone. The Satans are gone. So, I'd like to present a couple of definitions to you, working definitions, or definitions that we'll come back to over and over again. They're definitions we sometimes talk about in Bible study. Um, and I mentioned this last week, and I'm going to talk just a tiny bit more about it. The definition of sin. The definition of sin. What is sin? Okay, that's pretty good. Sin is actually an archery term. It's an archery term. It means to miss the mark, to miss the target. They talk about how much you sinned, by how far away you were from the, what's that thing they call in the center, the center, what's that called? Bullseye. The bullseye. How far away you are from the bullseye, that's how much you sinned. Okay. That's a pretty good definition of missing the mark, but I would like to suggest a functional definition of sin. A functional definition of sin is any action, any action you can take, or any action you can fail to take that would in some way make you less than God intends you to be. Sin is anything that makes you less than God intends you to be. Or might in some way diminish someone else. Make someone else less than God intends them to be. And just, just to show you how this works, just really briefly, um, we all understand that, that, that taking things don't belong to us as a sin. Right? Thou shalt not uh, what? To steal. Thou shalt not steal. Well, why is stealing a sin? It doesn't belong to you. It doesn't belong to you. But, you know, we can get, I, 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 I couldn't possibly disagree with that. The problem there is we can get into a circular logic because somebody might say, well, why is it wrong? You see? Well, because it doesn't want Well, why is that wrong? You know, we can go back and forth with this. And I would suggest that an answer to that, an appropriate answer to that, is because that will actually function on both of those levels. You see, if I come along and steal Eleanor's hat, it's going to make me less than I should be. Before we even worry about what that is to Eleanor, it's going to make me less than I should be. Why? Because now all of a sudden people go around saying, well, how can that guy be a pastor? He's active. You know? And maybe it's Eleanor's favorite hat. Maybe she really gets annoyed and she reports that to the Orange Police. And now I'm sitting handcuffed to a bench somewhere in the Orange Police Station. And, and, and Bess Whaley has to come and bail me out. <laughs> what do you say? Are we in trouble now? <laughs> <laughs> All right, Bess is not going to bail me out. Mala, however, will come and bail me out. I know Mala would. <laughs> Bess might try to break me out of this. <laughs> she wouldn't bail me out. Just the act of stealing diminishes me. Now, maybe uh, that's not that big a deal, I suppose. But what if it's something else? Or what if it has an emotional attachment? Or what if Eleanor thinks, boy, I thought that guy was my pastor. How could he steal my hat? And now all of a sudden, Eleanor is less than she could be. And that's what sin does. And, and, and you can test things, if you like. 
And by the way, if you can find a way to circumvent this principle, I really do want to, seriously, I want to hear about it because I think it's pretty solid. I think this is a pretty solid definition of sin. I think you can examine just about any action you can take. And you can hold it up to that principle, and you can determine whether that's a sin or not. I'm not saying it's always easy to figure out. But I'm saying that if you, if you really work it through, you can find this out. So that's kind of my working definition of sin. I can say, the reason, the reason why I think we need a working definition, I should just tell you, is because... I may have also mentioned in the past. At one point, sin was simple. It was easy. Why well, yeah, you just look at the Ten Commandments and say, well, breaking it is to sin. But even the most, even the most obvious of them, we come with gray areas. I don't know, what's the, what's the, what's the most obvious of the commandments, do you think? What's the most obvious commandments? Thou shalt not kill. Yeah, that's, that's one of the things. Thou shalt not kill. I mean, well, that's it. You know, killing somebody is wrong. I mean, it is. But even that, even that has gray areas. What if, um, and I pray this never happens to you, but I do know what this is like. What if you're walking down the street and someone comes up to you with a and you have a chance to defend yourself. In the process of defending yourself, that person loses his life. Let me make it even stickier than that. What if someone attacks someone you love, someone who's weak, someone who, a child or a spouse? Or... And the only way to prevent that circumstance is to. You see where I'm going with that? What about what about cases of abortion where the mother's life is at stake? What about cases of euthanasia where someone is in such incredible pain? Now, I don't have easy answers for those. There was a time in my life when I did. And I'll confess to you, I have no easy answers for any of those things. But I submit to you that a place to begin is to think, by taking this action, will I diminish myself? By taking this action, will I diminish someone else? Along with that, I think we can begin to understand a functional definition of what a saint is, of what a devil is. You see, Al so, so poignantly said that the, I don't want to misquote you here because that might be a sin, but you said that Satan was the author of, the author of evil. That's a really wonderful, wonderful statement about something truly horrible. The author of evil. I would suggest to you that Satan, the accuser, the prosecutor, is that entity which diminishes us. That entity which makes us less than God would have us be. And, and that, that brings us right to um, that brings us right back to our story. Jesus says to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You see, Peter, you're my friend. Peter, I love you. Peter, right now you're diminishing me. Peter, right now you're making me less. Peter, right now, in your accusatory way, you're telling me that what I am about to do, what God has called me to do, it's not right. Peter, you're using the standards of this world to hem me in, to put limits on what God has called me to do. I want you to hold that in your mind for a while, and, um, and I'll ask you another question. I, I hope this hasn't happened to you. I really do, but I, you know, I suspect it might have happened with some of you, and I'll tell you right now, it's happened to me. Have you ever been in a situation where someone has said to you, you're not qualified? You're not qualified? And that sounds like something would happen on a job interview. You're not qualified. Or maybe it's to join some kind of a club, or become some kind of, some kind of a group, or to get in some kind of position, and someone says, you're not qualified. 
would tell you to tell me a lot. Um, and, and I will tell you that when somebody says you're not qualified, potentially, potentially it's a kind of same. It may not be, but it also may be. Specifically when it comes to what God has called us to do. Notice what Jesus says. Those who follow me will pick up their crosses. Those who follow me will do the things that I do. And, and, and that seems that seems easy enough. At least it seems like nobody will want to stop you from that. But let me tell you something. If you try to follow Jesus, if you try to do the things that Jesus did, I can guarantee you will have Satan's all over the place. You will have all kinds of people saying to you, you can't do that. You shouldn't do that. That doesn't work in the real world. That's not my favorite point. I say, well, I'm going to do this because this is what Jesus did. I'm going to do this because this is what Jesus did. I'm going to do what Jesus did. And there's always somebody, and they're always, well, always, always, well intentioned. They've got my best interests at heart, they've got their best interests at heart. They've got everybody's best interests and said, well, that doesn't work. That can't work. You know, I, I, I've lived with people. I've lived with people. And people have done to me. And I suspect maybe you've done that. And maybe people have done to you. Well, there is a place. There is a place where I know we're not qualified. None of us are. And I don't think, well, you might be. You might be, but I strongly suspect you're not. And what you're probably not qualified to do, after all I've just said about Satan's, you're probably actually not qualified to say who the Satan's are. You're not. Know. You might think you are. I mean, sometimes I think I am. Sometimes I can go through a day and I can probably name about ten different Satan's I meet. Some of them I've known for a long time. And then I realize I'm not going to do that. I'm just not. Now there's some practical reasons. There's some practical reasons why you probably shouldn't go around doing that. Take, for example, a married couple. A married couple. Ah, oh, here's a representative married couple. Now, I know that this may not happen to you two, but I have heard, I have um, some qualified advice that married couples sometimes fight. They sometimes disagree. They sometimes don't see eye to eye. I mean, let's say that Carmen and John really take to heart what I have to say. That's the first part of it. And they go home and John has an idea. And Carmen doesn't like that idea. And Carmen says, John, get behind me, Satan. You have a mind with things of man, I'll go. At which point, John feel like, feels he's being limited by Carmen. And he says, No, Carmen, you get behind me. Because you're the Satan. Where do you think this is going to go? Eventually, John will cave in. <laughs> Well, I hope that happens in four months of marriage counseling. <laughs> yeah. There's some real practical reasons why you can't necessarily go around doing that. But more importantly, more importantly, I uh, came across a Satan who said to me, You have no right to preach the gospel. You have no right to preach the gospel. Or at least in my mind, I thought this person might be a saint because he was trying to limit me. And I was really tempted to say, get behind me, Satan. Until I realized something. I'm not qualified to call him Satan because on one level, he's actually quite accurate. I'm not good enough to preach the gospel. I'm not pure enough to preach the gospel. The only reason I can preach the gospel is because God makes me a new creation. Every day, God makes me a new creation. And then I realize, because I'm a new creation, I realize, you know, even though the 
this guy is annoying me, even though this guy seems to be satanic in his accusations, what I am qualified to say is that this person is a beloved child of God. And moreover, maybe the Satan that I can attack is not him, but me. Maybe the Satan that I need to attack is not him, but rather the one inside myself. It's tempting me to listen to that person. After all, if, 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 if Mala comes to me, we're not thinking that we're not thinking that Mala. If Mala comes to me and says, you know what? You shouldn't be doing it. By the way, it was Mala. <laughs> well, Mala's a time for opinion. The question is, am I going to allow that opinion to define everything I do? Well, I definitely shouldn't say, Mala, you're a Satan. But I should look to the Satan inside of myself. I should look to the devil. How did it get there? That's a topic for the sermon. But suffice it to say, it's there. And you've got it too. So, just to read rise really quickly, because we're kind of at the end of this lectionary season, we're going to shift abruptly next week. You go and meet devils, you meet them all the time. But we need to think about the way Jesus did. So, to talk about how Jesus met the devils, when Jesus met a devil, he did not allow him to speak, he did not allow him to find him. Even when it partly spoke the truth, even when the devil was about to say, I know who you are, the Son of God. Jesus did not allow that demon to speak. And when Jesus had the opportunity, he cast out those devils. But you will note in all the instances where Jesus cast out a devil, he never cast out the person who was possessed. Only the devil was cast out. Even Peter. Even Peter, who was getting our Lord's face and said, you can't do what God has sent you to do. Even in that instance, even in that instance, Jesus did not say, get away from me forever. Get out of my presence. So, as we move through our lives, as we move through our individual lives and our lives together, I pray that we learn I pray that we learn the spiritual skills to put the devil in its place, to cast it out, to silence it, and to remind us. May it be so. Good.